on uh, antibody testing. Uh, antibody testing has always been a uh, procedure uh, which does not need much information and it needs lots of information. But how do we process this information is always confusing. Some people feel that their antibody levels are high and they are going to go to the society without masks. Some people feel that their antibody levels are low. So they want to go for the another dose of uh, vaccine. Some people want to know which vaccine to take. Some people want to know uh, whether uh, <clears throat> they can have a booster dose of a different vaccine. The scenario is absolutely confusing and lots of things are circulating the market. Daily new studies are coming. So we thought it better to have a uh, talk about this topic, uh, which has been confusing various, various physicians all across India, not only in India, but all across the world. And we found that Dr. Sonal Saxena is uh, the best person to talk about it. And she has been uh, a prolific speaker. And uh, I know that uh, she hails from an institution from where I did my graduation and post-graduation. Very, very proud to be a graduate from London Medical College. And I welcome Dr. Uh, Mrs. Sonal Saxena. Dr. Mrs. Sonal Saxena is the Director, Professor, Head, Department of Microbiology, Maranayan Medical College. And she has the, not only the administrative responsibility of Department of Microbiology, but she has the state level uh, <clears throat> ICMR nodal officer, COVID laboratory uh, nodal officer, and the lab coordinator for the Delhi's COVID-19 zero survey. She has been uh, the recipient of various awards and fellowships, uh, including the RA Bhujwala Award and the WHO Fellowship. And she has been awarded the best poster, How Safe is a Short, short Course of uh, Potent Oral Broad Spectrum Antibiotics Among the Children. And she has delivered various orations and WHO chose person to develop the National Antimicrobial Distributorship Program, Government of Maldives, the, and she has published large number of papers. She has delivered orations. She has chaired sessions. She has written chapters in various books. This is very brief about her uh, introduction. Only one thing which I wish to say is that when she wants to, uh, she is speaking, everybody wants to listen. My, my friend, Dr. Raman Sardana, who is the uh, secretary of the Hospital Infection Control Society, I wanted to invite him for the uh, faculty uh, for the another topic, but he said it is better to listen to Dr. Sonal Saxena when she is speaking, everybody listens carefully and silently. So we welcome uh, warm, with warm hearts uh, to Dr. Mrs. Sonal Saxena. And uh, to chair the session, none other than uh, Dr. Rahul Nethani, who is a menologist par excellence and uh, who has done more than 1,000 uh, bone marrow transplants at the Saket Hospital. And uh, our own president, Dr. Vijay Roda, who has been the director of the MEX Hospital, who chaired the session and guide us all through the session. And to cut, cut the long story short, I invite once again, Dr. Mrs. Sonal Saxena to start her uh, deliberations. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Sonal Saxena. Welcome there. Thank you, sir, so much for the kind words. And I'm very, very comfortable now because my teacher is here. Dr. Raman uh, has been my undergraduate, postgraduate teacher, and I still my guru. So my first namaskar to him before I begin. And I can also see a few of my classmates logged in. So I hope I do justice to a very, very um, hot and burning topic. And uh, I hope the end result, I'm sure, is going to be very different from you had what you had expected. So trying to clear some of the confusions that we have regarding antibody testing. And uh, we've been working with antibodies oh, yeah. for the uh, past seven, eight months now. We have about seven um, uh, projects lined up, few of them with uh, WHO as a unity project, few of them with DBT. And uh, that this is something which is we are, we are very familiar with, something which began on 31st of December when people were ringing the new year. And uh, lesser we knew that all the new years are going to stop after 2019. So, um, and we are very, very familiar with this timeline and how all hell broke loose after March 11th and we are still reeling under the same effects. And this is the little uh, foe which has spread across barriers, across everywhere. And I want you to remember a few things as I take you down its microbiology. One is that, one fact is that it's an enveloped virus, thank God. And it's got a few structures which have come in useful when we talk about the antibodies. One is the spike. What is a spike? The spice is its organ of attachment. It's something what uh, the armor that this soldier has 
to attach to these receptors which are expressed throughout our body and physicians know best about these receptors i'm not going to tell you anything about it what i'm going to talk about it that there is an envelope which is non immunogenic there is a membrane which is non immunogenic and there is a nucleocapsid which encloses this rna which is highly highly immunogenic so uh, taking it further this is the area that we are going to concerned about so let's let's see a little bit about this area as to why we are concerned about it's a flower like tricuspid structure and this is the area which binds to the ace receptors or is known as the receptor binding domain so there are two subunits as i said the s1 unit which is responsible for binding to ace and the s2 unit which is responsible for the finally fusing the whole virus with the cell membrane so he, here this s subunit has got two things n terminal domain and a receptor binding domain so without confusing you any more or any more microbiology i will just say that um, we will just take a little step forward and remember these that there is an s1 and then there is a receptor binding domain and why we have discussed it in so much of detail is that spike is highly highly immunogenic but it also has a neutralizing activity so any antibody which is against this s or spike then it will have the capacity to neutralize the virus any antibody which is specifically against the receptor binding domain can be very strongly linked to viral neutralization now this is so much so about the spike the nucleocapsid protein is something which is responsible for the viral replication and assembly and it is abundantly expressed during infection because it's a main part of the virus multiplying so the expression is very high it is highly immunogenic it induces the antibody production which is earlier than s but it does not produce neutralization effect it is there it indicates that the virus is has been multi has multiplied and that is what has given rise to these antibodies the n gene is more conserved but there are limitations that these assays are they are more stable but the various number of studies have shown that they may be binding but they are not neutralizing the s based assays are that they usually measure the total antibodies and how this they do is i will come to that later on so functionally we are all familiar with the igm igg iga so going back the slide what we saw how a spike is there and our receptor binding domain is there and a nuclear protein nucleocapsid protein is there and all these areas are going to elicit antibody production in us first would be the anti nucleocapsid antibodies which will come very fast as the virus starts to multiply the body starts to respond and then come the anti spike antibodies which could be anti s1 which could be anti s2 but the most important are anti receptor binding domain only when the antibodies are against that domain they are neutralizing but it is not essential all neutralizing antibodies will be anti rbds but all anti s or anti rbds may not be neutralizing so we have to remember this and as we go ahead it will answer a lot of questions that you have generally in your mind now just like any other antibody response this is also similar to that the igm rises first within a few days 5 to 7 days of infection then starts the igg and if you see this why this is important is this is this arrow is the onset of infection but this is a window that i am most concerned about so any person who is measuring the total antibody just look at this site here igg has just crossed the detection limit that means it has started to produce whereas the igm is very very high so that means that it, any kit which measures total antibody will say oh you've got this much antibody titers but in reality they are very short lived igm antibodies which are going to go down within a few weeks so the total antibody if we measure we are going to be stuck here because you will have igas also which many studies have now shown that iga is higher in severely ill patients because probably 
the ACE receptor expression is maximum at mucosal areas and so the mucosal immunity is highest. None of the vaccines have addressed this issue till now. Only the nasal vaccine can address this issue of production of IgA. But the advantage of IgA is that it is gets secreted in the breast milk and that's how usually the infants remain protected. Then the IgG, which has a neutralizing activity, but IgM doesn't have neutralizing activity. And so the total, the take home message from this slide is that if you do total antibody assay, it will confuse you. So moving ahead further, this, this was a paper which we published recently in a Japanese journal where we found that the highest zero positivity found in the administrative staff. Imagine now, this is our own hospital. Malana Zad and LNH hospital. And we had a huge number, 1400 employees, which included 1217 health workers. And we found that the administrative staff had the lowest, possibly that they were, uh, you know, exposed more and they were not sick. They were all asymptomatic. And the lowest was among medical doctors. And this was statistically significant. This could probably be due to the fact that the doctors were a little more cautious. They were more, uh, they were more compliance to hand hygiene and PPE than the administrative staff. This was higher with people who lived in containment zone and with males. Non-pharmaceutical interventions were not associated with the reduction. You, you should go, uh, I've given the reference. You should go back and read this. Uh, this just read the last part of the discussion where we found that um, there was people who were taking um, all these, uh, you know, non allopathic drugs for uh, this, for prevention, for, uh, you know, COVID. they all had very low antibodies. So they were at a very high risk and they believed that they were, uh, you know, very much protected. Then came the spike and ncp based antibody assays now these are the ones which we are bothered about the neutralizing antibodies which is actually an immunoglobulin that independently blocks the viral entry into the host cells and it is the nab assessment which indicates the protective immunity both in zero diagnosis and in evaluation of convalescent plasma therapy and in vaccine development and responses even in monoclonal antibody development so it is this what we are concerned about but we have to remember this, that not everybody will develop neutralizing antibodies. Secondly, the level of prevention offered by these, we are still very new into this disease. So we don't know that what is the level of protection offered by which titers of neutralizing antibodies. And we also right now are very shaky about the duration of protection of this antibodies. Only recently in um, May, there is one study which has been published, which says that the antibodies persist for nine months. If you link these with severity, it was found that neutralizing antibodies were mostly seen in mild patients after the third week of illness, even if they were asymptomatic but RT-PCR positive patients. Pneumonia patients showed a shorter zero conversion time. This is from these two studies, the findings. Then higher antibodies were seen of the neutralizing in nature in 31 to 84 in younger patients. These are basically uh, the meta-analysis and review articles that uh, have found these which after combining a lot of studies. Then these variables of kinetics is very similar. IgM switches to IgG. That's similar, but there has been contradictory report. A study from Wuhan said that this variability, they found that both IgM and IgG rise together, but later on it was found that it it was not happening in majority of cases. Then recently this March, March 27 study is what I'm talking about, where they have found that neutralizing antibodies in uh, people who have got infected persist for nine months, although their titers go down to a very, very low level and which may not be detectable by the routinely used assays. Their durability of these and how, how they are correlating remains unclear. And uh, this was one study very recently reported where it said that 80% are protected from reinfection. That's a huge Denmark cohort of millions of people which said that 80% were protected from reinfection 
but this protection went down to only 47% amongst people who were 65 years of older. So this actually helps in strategizing the vaccine, um, uh, you know, strategy as to why these people were preferred for vaccine in the initial stages. Then probability of predicting these responses will be enhanced if the S1 or RBD is used in the assay. And I'll come to these assays and you will come to know that there are very few assays which actually detect the antibodies to S1 or RBD. These are relatively high and an early antibiotic response is targeted to the S antigen, which was elicited in patients with COVID-19 compared to the N antigen. So it is there. And this is another study that uh, we did with uh, THSTI. This was published very, very recently in American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, a very, very extensive work where we followed uh, the patients who were admitted in our hospital, which being a COVID, largest COVID hospital of Delhi. So uh, in, um, and here we followed these patients for a very long time. And what we found was that the proportion of serological response increased with the severity of disease, which is quite expected. And the participants with severe disease, almost all had severe disease if they had serology positive. But in mild and moderate infections, about 90% were positive and about, you can say, 78% were positive for asymptomatic. Even the asymptomatic, 80% had IgG antibodies to RBDs. And this is specifically that we measured the RBD antibodies and the nucleocapsid separately. But these were also not measured as neutralizing antibodies. Now, this was another work from uh, very early during the stage where they found that in the critical patients, these antibody titers were very, very high. Whereas in the non-critical patients, either they went down or they were not, you know, or they were maintained at a particular level. Now, there are various platforms which are available for antibody detections. We have uh, chemiluminescent assays, we have ELISAs, we have radioimmuno assays, which are rarely used because of radioactivity hazards. We have rapid assays, which are like um, lateral flow assays, uh, which are very, very popular now with the antigen testing, but were extremely unpopular when they were launched in June. I remember on a Sunday, we opened our laboratory to do training for uh, healthcare workers, which were posted in community and uh, for the lateral flow assays for an antibodies. And within two days came that ICMR had withdrawn those and all those had to be returned to CPA, uh, all the kits. So we've come a long way. Now ICMR has approved a few lateral flow assays, but generally lateral flow assays perform poorly when you compare it with Chemi and ELISA. Why CLIA or... Um, as we say, call it chemi in our language, is better is because it allows a better estimation rather than giving you just a qualitative detection like a positive or negative. It allows you a quantitative detection. It is less error prone. It's an automated system. It's faster and it has a higher TAT. So if you want to do for a zero survey, say 2000 samples a day, ELISA would be next to impossible, but you can do it in a client. And obviously we always go for a better technology but there are huge variations. The variations can be from kit to kit, from assay to assay, and from machine to machine. And sometimes the same sample, if you give, put it in one machine, it will give you a different result, and another, it will give you a different result. My own sample, which I took at the time of my second dose of vaccination on 18th of February, I put it up with one ELISA that we had, and the report came were negative for antibodies. So I was like, okay, my first vaccine dose has not worked. Same sera was put in another kit and I got an antibody index, not tighter, an antibody index of 14. That means 14 times the normal. Same sample, same time, same sera. So this variation is sometimes mind boggling, especially for practicing physicians. Then. Higher antibodies will not suggest anything. They don't suggest immunity. They don't suggest a longer last immunity. So the purpose is lost. So the purpose of saying that higher antibodies are going to protect is not there. Then for convalescent plasma, when this convalescent plasma was being used, 
the neutralizing titer of 1 is to 320 or more was considered you know enough for you to give that plasma so if we have a different different variations and we have different different ones and all these platforms which use is we are concerned about either the antibodies to nucleocapsid protein antibodies to spike antibodies to rbd and these could be total igm ngg iga or it could be igg or it could be iga then there could be just minding assays which most of these assays are or could be neutralizing assays now technically neutralization assays are done with plaque neutralization and plaque neutralization is an extremely complicated procedure which requires bsl3 facilities takes about 2 to 4 days and it's very dangerous because it needs maintenance of a live virus and trained manpower so then came let's use a uh, nowadays we use surrogate for everything so let's use a surrogate for viral neutralization test that brought down some kind of equipment and some kind of manpower but still a very very technically demanding test then there was this cpas sars cov neutralization antibody test which kind of detects the neutralization antibodies specifically it detects by a competitive elisa as we call it and it detects the uh, a test this has been uh, patented by dr lin fa wang lab and uh, this is marketed as cpas covid neutralization test this was the first one but what are the technologies let's move on to clia this may sound a very complicated picture but this was just to show you that so many platforms are available and there are various various platforms and various various principles attached to it for example this is the ocd or the or not the ocd of psychiatry but the ortho clinical diagnostics of my, in microbiology they make a clia system which is called vitros and they have an anti uh, sars cov total they have an igg then there is an abbott architect which became very famous in between that it was the only one which gave anti spike s1 rbd immunoglobulins positive was at more than 50 au so they were semi quantitative similarly there was another one which is very important there is one from roche there is one from diasorin which is an anti spike s1 s2 igg and what is important with diasorin is that the company claims that they have 94% correlation with plaque neutralization assay. So it correlates very well. So it, the detection above 15, it is a quantitative assay, which tells you that if your levels are above 15, then they are neutralizing antibodies. Then they have a trimeric C, S, which is with micro neutralization assay. And this is the one which uh, is being marketed, I think, now. This is the older one. Then another one, Siemens Italica, is uh, what um, we were also using for some time as a trial mode, but we uh, were not very comfortable using the machine as it gave only an index. Most of these, you will find the cutoff is either S by C or COI or things like that. This is actually a way to determine in our laboratories uh, in a layman terminology, I can only explain that this is a division of the positive sample to the uh, to what we see, um, you know, uh, the control. So whatever the machine control uh, has, it's a ratio of that. So anything above one means that the sample is positive. And uh, then we have uh, various ELISA kits. The first one was the coverage ELISA, which was essentially, as one of my junior put it one day, that um, I asked him when the coverage ELISA came, and I said, uh, we are getting some coverage for a validation because we have a lot of patient load. So we are going to take in the samples and let's see how this coverage pans out. So he read about it and he got back to me and said, Ma'am, ye to virus ka hai. So it's it's like it's the whole inactivated virus, all the antigens are expressed. So it's got a mixture of a total assay. It's now it's called a total IgG assay. When it came, it was total antibody assay, which was completely qualitative, which measured anti-NCP, anti-spike, anti-RBD, everything in one go. It still measures everything, it doesn't measure separately. Then there is a Wanti uh, total IgG IgM assay. We, we are working with this. It's an excellent kit. 
and it is a semi quantitative assay so it gives you an antibody index so suppose your index is 14 the normal is 1 so that means that you've got a uh, little more than about 14 yeah, times yeah. the normal yeah huh? uh, then we have a uh, few from calbiotech uroimmune these are all the only neutralization assay is from cpas and cyanobiologicals and only last two weeks ago i think Jamitra, the Indian company, has launched this neutralization assay as a uh, Make in India neutralization assay for the first time. Then there is a, um, many of us have got this machine. We also have it in our hospital, which is a Vidas from Biomirio, which has an NTSV and RBD, and it gives a semi-quantitative analysis. We have not yet started using this machine, so I don't have any experience with it. This was another paper that we did with uh, another work that we, and this is still ongoing which we did with uh, DBT and DBT made an Indian consortium where uh, myself and uh, the people from Amalana Azad were part of it. Three of us were part of this and this was published in a very prestigious journal of clinical virology. We were part of this consortium. This was again THSTI uh, DBT Institute. And here we found that we compared uh, three assays. One was the diasorin assay. Um, S1 anti-spike, S1 NSG, which measures this according to spike, and we covered the Zydus uh, coverage ELISA, which is marketed by Zydus, and we found that the sensitivity was pretty good for these. Even coverage uh, showed a specificity of 99 and 100, and they showed an extremely very good agreement. But they were able to coverage was the lowest in this, and but the RBD ELISA, which TSSTI made that and the diasorin ELISA worked very, very well. So we were quite happy with these results because one, because it was both, they were both uh, in-house assays. Uh, then coming on to where these, uh, you know, we've talked so much about the anti-spike proteins and that is how these vaccine targets were identified. And the only reason I've included this slide is that I get a lot of questions when people ask that, uh, does my taking Covishield produce NCP antibodies? So, and many of times you must have seen that you take a vaccine and there are no antibodies because the kit that you use to measure post-vaccine, you took Covishield and your kit is measuring only NCP antibodies. So you'll not get anything because all these vaccines, except our own Covaxin, gives you only anti-spike anti because you're using only spike so it gives you antibodies only against spike protein so you have only anti-spike antibodies it is only covaxin which gives you some amount of anti-ncp also and all these they have measured neutralizing antibodies which have gone up into and they have also measured the t-cell responses which is uh, you know many a times we are all inundated with questions yeah, that, we'll why these t cell responses yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, the one is done is speaking so this t cell responsive is also being measured at the time when we had now um, i came across these few indian studies in the past few days they have got published and it is this study the second doi which is still non peer reviewed is still it's available on medex rv uh, which has generated quite an uproar uh, by saying that the first, uh, after first dose, only 43% of Covaxin zero convert, and the mean titer is pretty low. Whereas after the second dose, this this the first DOI is from the first study, and the second is when they finished the second part. This is uh, from Kolkata, so I think a multicentric evaluation where after the second dose they found that more than 98, almost 100% uh, people zero converted. Whereas, um, you know, in Covaxin, 80%. And this has created quite an uproar. Look at the mean IQR. Then another study which showed that antibody response developed only after 14 days or later of giving the vaccine. And the second dose was associated with further increase in antibody levels at day 45 compared to day 28. But immunity is not guided by the humoral arm only. And that is what the Covaxin manufacturer has tweeted yesterday, saying that it's not just the antibody that you can measure and say that my vaccine is low. Nobody likes to call their child bad, even if it's 
even the gabbar singh's mother would have said my son is the best so uh, to conclude uh, if you look at the immunity in sars cov vaccine sorry this has been taken from an american site so that's why it says the mrna vaccines you will have neutralizing antibodies as well as memory t cells and both of these together will give you a protective immunity and just a few words before i wind up about what is causing the why is there is an uproar everybody wants an antibody testing obviously it assesses the prior exposure and infers potential immunity sometimes you may not know you you must have seen all the patients who are like in our hospital whenever we go to a non covid portion like we went in january february and march what happens is that all the surgeries you screen patients for rt pcr so this time for few patients we screened for antibody also and we suddenly found that the patients who were not rt pcr there that time rt pcr was negative but their serology was positive and they came out and said we've never had any disease so maybe you infer a prior exposure you can assess for epidemiological purposes estimation of attacks rate r nots and case fatality rates if you want to measure the impact of control measures the zero survey before lockdown and after lockdown will actually give you some amount of how much people have not been exposed or exposed during this then obviously identification of plasma donors looking research for monoclonal antibodies and assessment of why vaccine immunogenicity pan corona therapeutics and vaccines and also for identifying potential zoonotic disease transmission i really want to know who took that lion sample in the zoo so what causes the virus to change this this is the latest you know today morning only we had a genomic surveillance meeting where india is making a huge program of genomic surveillance and uh there are various various variants which thankfully who has named according to this and why why these changes matter is that uh, this is the size of the protein and this is the unit and you will find that uh, in what we are concerned about is this the receptor binding domain is 319 to 541 uh, base pairs and it is this that we are concerned about so any change which occurs in receptor binding domain this to this will change the virus binding because it will change the spike protein so we may have heterologous vaccines very soon which are going to target this and how these variants are affecting is it's it's a lecture by itself that these variants how they change but just remember this was i think in some newspaper in the national news where if the effect is the Uh, variant is more transmissible you definitely need more people to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity so the figure which was originally 65 to 70% our policy makers should note this has now gone up to 83% so on the delta plus variant which just came a few days back i think we'll go up to 90% so we need to vaccinate actually everybody so uh, the ability to detect neutralizing antibodies can help us gain an additional insight into what this means and patients should not interpret the results as telling them that they are immune or have any level of immunity from the virus this was from tim stenzel who's the fda expert on this so i just hope i've brought in cleared some confusion i don't know about the confidence so that's it if there are any questions i'll take that uh thank you dr sonal i think uh, uh, you have very lucidly covered all the aspects and i i i would say that uh, it has caused more confusion <laughs> 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 okay more let's... is the knowledge more is the knowledge more is the confusion <laughs> anyway uh, anyway uh, dr nethani uh, who is an immunology immunologist and who has been uh, seeing number of patients with very very poor immunity because of bone marrow transplants he wants to know some questions kind dr nethani may i may i invite you to ask your questions please yeah so i think the session is open for questions i have put in few but other people could also maybe type in their questions in their chat box and i can set the ball rolling so uh, for an individual patient so you know the clinical trials and uh, some specific populations aside uh, do we need to do antibody testing at all for an individual patient no 
there is see when we when we do antibody for any test like when we do for typhoid when we do for say any any disease per se what happens is that we have data which is lasting decades so we know that this is the population level and this is the level of exposure and this is how that you are acutely infected but if you look back into microbiology how useful is vidal test how use in in your diagnose in making a diagnosis how useful is dengue antibody and all of these came with a huge bang they said that oh we found antibody test to dengue we do but within few years we had to switch to ns1 so antibody testes are never there they are never never used for diagnosis unless and until we are looking at a disease which has a long incubation period like hiv so there we know that yes the antibody levels have developed to such an extent that yes they were going to remain hepatitis b they and we know their kinetics that they remain in the level for such a long time here the disease is only 1 and 1/2 years old we hardly have any data and what we have is a very conflicting data so i appreciate you being very clear and straightforward about saying no to antibody testing now one more question uh, why should we vaccinate at all the people who have been already confirmed a covid positive so not suspect but confirmed by rt pcr so uh, why are we suspecting that natural immunity will not last we do not vaccinate patients you know having other viral diseases so why covid is it just lack of understanding lack of data so vaccinate everyone or there is something more to it we believe in evidence based medicine so our evidence says that the natural antibodies i have said in my presentation also we actually don't have that much data which says that to how long the antibodies are going to last so one is that the other is that there is recently i uh, just read about two days back one article which said that if you give a single dose after to those patients who uh, received uh, who tested positive confirmed it gives you the titer as as good as uh, you know um, two doses of vaccine because one acts as a uh, booster the infection itself either acts as a booster or the vaccine acts as a booster but the thing is suppose first patient x was positive in april and he gets vaccinated now then he will need two doses because maybe his memory would have gone uh, you know finished or the even the chicken pox vaccine when you give you say that after 20 25 years it loses its uh, you know body forgets so that could be one reason the other is probably it was a logistic issue that how how to identify how to pick out those people and it will bring in more hesitancy so it was i think a policy decision that uh, okay let's vaccinate everybody yeah i think so <laughs> so that also you know brings out this point of the booster that uh what fun having that booster when the antibody titers do not mean much so somebody may have a titer of 20 and somebody may have a titer of 4000 we have seen titers up to 20000 and you know actually very in covid it's not yet we are not reached the stage of booster this is a primary vaccination which the manufacturer says needs two doses right so the manufacturer says it needs two doses 28 days apart we go by that then the manufacturer brings in more data and says we can now increase this to 84 days and we go by that so it's the manufacturer's data which says that we need to give two primary immunization is two doses it's not acting as a booster so pardon me if i use the term booster what what i meant to say was that the antibody titers will increase but so will the memory cells wo hota na there is so much of redundancy in medicine that you read about brachial artery in anatomy then you read again in surgery and then you read again in radiology why do you keep teaching it again and again so that the child remembers because it's such an important thing so as a teacher i can only tell you that things get repeated so similarly we are trying to train our immune system and our memory cells by giving repeated exposures so that's how the vaccine has been built so maybe uh, dr can i yeah, yeah dr raul can i ask one question oh, yes please yeah. yeah so actually excellent talk madam uh you showed our study that is the covid 2 uh, 
Uh, I am part of that. Rather, I am one of the author of uh, that. The last uh, study. Yeah, COVID study. So we have already sent for the peer review. And as you know, when this study was published, there was a Twitter war. So, uh, but in, in our conclusion, we must have read that we have not told anything against Covaxin or Covishield. Rather, we also showed that the response with the second dose of the post-vaccination with Covaxin was quite good. And uh, as far as the breakthrough infection is concerned, uh, I think in that uh, definitely the Covaxin has scored much better. So still we are under peer review, so we'll not talk much about that, but uh, I think we are doing the third sampling and we are also planning, uh, we are not it is in our protocol that the last sampling will be done in the September. So also we will be able to see after six months what happens to the antibody titer. So that is one part of, then I think the final conclusion can be drawn. But one thing, one question my very important is that uh, some people ask that uh, uh, we are doing anti-spike antibody. Uh, so does it gives the, uh, as you already cleared it, that uh, this doesn't give uh, a passport that you are fully protected or a, this is something like just like neutralizing antibody. Uh, but you also showed one study where you showed that the if the at, there is at least some resemblance, if uh, you have got a good antibody titer, anti spike antibody, uh, it or uh, it also matches to some extent. It gives you that is some uh, antibody that the antibody is giving you some immunity. But it is again very debatable at present. Ki, as Dr. S K Gupta also uh, wrote very well in our COVID update. Uh, that uh, it doesn't, doesn't give you any guarantee you are protected and how much that will help you. But anyway, till that, uh, I think the anti-spike antibody is a very good uh, antibody, which is possible to do. We also plan to do other antibodies or something. It is, I think, no, no study is doing uh, the cell immunity assessment. So we don't know what is happening exactly. But I think, uh, my uh, yeah, so what is your opinion on that? Well, I think the uh, phase three trials and the extended phase three trials, which Covaxin is doing, I think they must be looking at cell immunity right now. I have not read anything to that. But there were a few studies which I found where people have actually looked in at the, uh, you know, T-cell. And um, right now in my college also, some uh, student has initiated a PhD thesis on this in post vaccine is subject to see a T-cell response. It's a little complicated and an expensive proposition, but maybe people are working on it, I think, and we'll have some results later on. Yeah. Because we are in, in vaccine, we are as good as the ER is. So we are just five or six months into this vaccine. So right now also, but... Sir, which kit did you use to measure in your uh, this thing? Did you, you use? already fought that kit, that did dia, uh, diasorin. Diasorin. So we used so, that. So uh, because diasorin has got the best uh, correlation yeah. with neutralizing assays. Yeah. So if you, uh, since yours is under peer review, and I was quite, um, uh, I read your full article, and I was quite impressed by the way it's been analyzed and said, and it's 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 a mere observation. You've not done any. Um, uh, you know, per se intervention on your own. But yeah. I also, we are also working with on a WHO Unity project. The results are yet to be published, so I can't share it. But we've also found similar uh, results because we also had both the vaccines and we are now getting Sputnik from next month. So maybe we'll compare that also. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I think these are all for the benefit of all of us. Anyway, the company doesn't claim more than 80% uh, yeah, yeah. protection by itself. So they should not be complaining. And I okay, thank you. Uh, now, now I'm going to ask like a patient, you know, it is very difficult to ask like a doctor, you know. And then the patient says, I because there's a momentum set up in the society that we want to go for antibody testing. Can we have a guideline for the patient uh, that if you have got a co vaccine, then you go for this kit, if you have got a COVID shield, then you go for this kit, or if you have recovered from the uh, <clears throat> recovered from the infection, then you should, you should go for the antibody. In case you want to go, though, we discourage you to go for that, then you go for this kit. Or if somebody comes out with a result, somebody says that uh, he or she got in best, vaccinated by co-vaccine and they got a test done by the diacerin, which in two people in their family shows a positive result, they have good antibody titer, but in third person, who is also a young person, shows a negative titer. What answer do we give them? 
Sir, it's a very complicated issue. It has happened in my own family. Me, <laughs> me, my daughter and my husband, uh, in spite of being vaccinated, got infected in April, landed up in hospital also to that extent. And two days back, we got our antibodies done. All three of us have got very high titers of antibodies. But my in-laws who stay with us 24 by 7, who were vaccinated with one another vaccine, same vaccine as uh, my husband, not my, uh, mine was different. They have zero titers. So I have faced this in my family also that hey, vaccine bekar thi, ya hum bekar hai, kya ho gaya? So this is a very, very common observation which you will find. And this will be there more in people who have comorbidities, who have dysfunctional immune response due to some reason. They have gut dysbiosis because the whole feeding of immune system is fueled by gut. So what happens is that this is, this is just a theory. And as a theory, as my CVU said, I work more with antimicrobial resistance. So uh, this is a theory that uh, the gut dysbiosis, because it is known to be related to cause imbalances in the immune system, the, every person is not taken care of by vaccine. The only issue is we never measure immunity post BCG. We never measure immunity post chicken pox, measles, vaccines. So we don't know how those people respond to vaccines. Plus, the manufacturer themselves says that their protection, except for Pfizer, which probably gives 97%, no other vaccine gives protection for more than 80-85% for COVID. Will you advise the testing by a different kit uh, to those patients who have got uh, a negative report by uh, some other kit? Sir, it depends because if something will look after the total antibody, suppose a person is negative by diasorin, then he might say, okay, I will go for a total antibody. Total antibody might be there because there may be anti-nucleocapsid antibodies, especially if he received Covaxin. So this is going to go on and on and he's going to go lab shopping so that's not going to end anywhere. See, when it comes to like uh, kit uh, being uh, like uh, released in the market, then the then the uh, the producer is going to talk about the very high titers of the neutralizing antibodies. Suppose like so very shortly we are going to have the uh, Novavax vaccine, on which they have been boasting about the very very highest titers of the neutralizing antibody. On the other hand, we say that the neutralizing antibody titers do not correlate. Uh, with your duration or the level of protection. How, how do you correlate both of them? Like, is it is it just a selling tactics uh, to the uh, vaccine or to the kit? Uh, Dr. Gupta, I showed you the slide where all the vaccine manufacturers have given the data. There's, um, you know, uh, this much. None of them is going beyond 850. That's with Pfizer, the neutralizing antibody titers with Pfizer and Moderna are the best and they are also not going beyond 800. So it's more of a, not that, but actually it's a gameplay of statistics. You know, you have a curve, bell-shaped curve. So you might, you will have people who are at very high titers of antibodies, but you will also have people in the low zone. And when you do the average, they will tell you it produced antibodies up to 850, but will not tell you that it produced 53 also. So it's 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 a kind of a you know selling point. That's true. Uh, Madam, there are some people who are going abroad. They want to go abroad and they have taken one dose of vaccine, which is uh, not yet approved in USA. And what is going on about these people? They they are likely to face some problems over there in the passport, uh, like a visa or the entry of the uh, uh, entry into the USA. I or think till matter. right now, no country has imposed this restriction that uh, you have to be vaccinated, uh, you should have a vaccine passport before entry. But the countries will soon be doing it. And uh, going by the media reports, I think by July, even Covaxin will have uh, WHO approval because they've also submitted their phase three data. Because the phase three data was not there and it was authorized for emergency use, I think that's why it was approved in a trial mode. So I think that's why uh, it, WHO is taking time to approve it. But any vaccine which is, uh, and it was an indigenous vaccine to India, so India will have to defend its pitch. Whenever something is produced in a developing country, that country has to defend its pitch. 
so i think very soon it will be approved right now i don't think any country is returning travelers the only thing is that people are returning because they do not have a qr code on the rt pcr report and they are made to wait 72 hours and spend your own money and stay in an airport hotel and not move out if you don't have a qr code so that problem has been sorted in the past one month by the icmr report itself now comes with a qr code Uh, madam the as uh, the breakthrough infection study which was done in the malanand medical college and other places that shows that uh, the uh, healthcare workers they got infected up to 39 days uh, the medium interval was 39 days post uh, second dose does Actually, it indicate does it indicate that the people remain uh, susceptible to the infection up to 39 days and it is only the uh, the uh, cell mediated immunity which works in these people so well, i think uh... if if you look at the, these were mainly there was no antibody done this this was mainly a telephonic uh, paper uh, those healthcare workers were contacted they were asked their doses of vaccination and uh, even the rt pcr portal that icmr it gives you the date of vaccination now so that is how we calculate you know retrospectively calculated that the thing is that even the manufacturing manufacturers say that two weeks after the second dose before that you are not protected so they have kind of you know safeguard themselves with fda and with cdesco saying that uh, two six weeks from the first dose or two weeks after the second dose so covid shield that is now increased to two weeks plus 84 days so th- nowhere do they say so th- 39 days especially during that time in mulana azad there were 1100 patients admitted with covid with a daily you know there were a footfall of about 600 patients a day we were getting 550 to 700 results uh, rt pcr per day in our department so that was that was a time i just got for bit so uh, maybe at that time uh, more people got infected in spite of vaccination because there was so much of exposure that's right Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Is it uh, is it essential or is it uh, mandatory? Is it desire desirable to get a CRP test done before the vaccination? No, no, I don't think so. You you people are physicians. I I don't think it is. Uh, it doesn't make a sense. Many people have asked me this, but it doesn't make a sense. CRP is an acute phase reactant. It only tells you if even if there is an inflammation in your body, what does vaccine got to do with it? We never do it in children when we give them the vaccine. Do we do it? This is also same vaccine, and Covaxin is a standardized whole inactivated vaccine. It's not uh, something like mRNA which has come for the first time. Some people they want to know whether that is is it good to take aspirin uh, along with the uh, vaccination second dose, third dose, uh, second dose or the first dose. Sir, I don't know. This is probably related to the clotting uh, incidences which have occurred, but. Uh, technically, I feel that those two mechanisms are totally different, and aspirin doesn't work on those uh, clots. So I think it is just a fear psychosis that people are doing that. I don't think there is any. Is was COVID uh, was COVID shield a, a, for us uh, healthcare workers? Uh, we were we guinea pigs to COVID shield initially <laughs> because. I don't think so, sir. I have as much faith in COVID COVID shield as an Covaxin. No, the duration. I'm saying because it has become eight uh, to twelve and twelve to sixteen now, so it was four weeks for all the healthcare workers. So there and there were a lot of breakthrough infections in the healthcare workers. So could that be a reason, sir? Actually, why they have increased now is uh, if if you read the original study which recommends from England, they have been recommending it from February that you can increase the duration of uh, interval to eighty four days. That study in UK found that. you can ha- increase the duration to 84 days the issue was that um, in india at that time we did not uh, you know accept their uh, this thing and uh, probably the policy makers were in a hurry to uh, you know i would feel i would privilege rather than uh, say guinea pigs that uh, the country thought that the frontline workers needed first and uh, i don't think we were made guinea pigs at all there is a data which now says possibly the reason behind this data is that we mount antibodies to adenovirus so uh, when the second dose comes early what happens is that our antibodies which are there now covid shield is an 
RNA, which is put inside another adenovirus. So if you attack the adenovirus, our ready-made antibodies after the first dose, they attack the uh, this thing. And one, this is one of the hypotheses. So if you increase the duration, those antibodies go down and the efficacy is better. So uh, the, in EBM, everything has got evidence. Now we have evidence that it works for 84 days. So I think that's why. Dr. Last Laboratory is doing neutralization antibody, uh, neutralizing antibody uh, I think many are doing. Apollo is also doing. Uh, Gangaram is also doing because they have... Uh, no, 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 Dr. Lal Laboratory is doing for 4,000 rupees. It turned around time is 40 hours. See, now J Mitra is selling. So if J Mitra is come now, every lab will have because it will not be imported now. So there will not be a shortage and imports and embargoes and all that. So now I think in, in another 15, 20 days, only today I was talking to his sales guy and he said maybe by end of next month, uh, they will be in full supply. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pankaj, you want to ask some question? I want to ask one question, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, when we talk about uh, herd immunity, it is the vaccinated people or the after natural infection also? Sir, by definition, it is vaccinated people. Only vaccinated? Yes, sir. By, by epidemiological definitions, herd immunity refers to vaccinated people. Uh, secondly, um, when we say vaccine, vaccine is 80% effective, what about those 20% people who uh, don't develop antibodies, what they should do? Sir, this we are not yet sure of that to what actually they did not develop antibodies because nobody is looking at the T cell immunity. So up antibodies, you will be able to see, but you can't say whether it is, uh, you know, uh, those... But the vaccine definitely gives 100% protection. It claims to give 100% protection to severe disease. So you will get infected, but, and, but you will not develop a severe disease. And this we have seen also in the past two months. People did, who were vaccinated, amongst us only, we saw so many of us got infected, but we came out. And people who were not vaccinated landed up in a very... Uh, uh, in ICUs and in sad situations. So I feel the vaccine almost gives protection fully for severity. Then we should, why we should say 80% if it is 100%? Uh, so it, gives, it says that it gives almost 100% protection to disease severity. But it no literature says in the world that a, there is a vaccine which will be 100% effective, efficacious. There is no vaccine which uh, they says or the manufacturer says that they are 100%. Uh, my last question is, uh, one of my patients who had uh, uh, COVID in the first wave, now it is uh, almost uh, eight, nine months, uh, but the CRP is still 100, 112. And should we, she get vaccination? Sir, uh, how many days has she become negative? Uh, eight, nine months back, um, she had uh, COVID and... Um, so, but there uh, is no data to support CRP with vaccination. I don't think, I, I have not come across any data. I think Dr. Sonal has given a very, uh, one, very, one, a very, very nice, just, just, just wait for. I think we are getting a little time uh, shortage. Ma'am, Dr. Sonal, I'll, I'll, like, I'll like to ask you, but given data and the present scenario, would you like to get yourself uh, vaccinated with the vaccinated with the booster dose? And this, this question pertains to every health worker. You have already received two doses of vaccine. Uh, and I have like received to... two doses and I have received the natural dose also. So my vaccine titles were 19.5 day before yesterday. So <laughs> antibody titles. So... Uh, I don't know what to do with it. So I, I presume that I, as the booster government allows, I will take the booster because I am so scared. So I, I don't want to take any risk. If you are, yeah, but will, you, will you recommend it to the government that you allow boosters to the uh, I think the, government, it, the moment we have data to support that after nine months or 12 months, you have to give a booster. The government will uh, definitely give that. We'll come out with those guidelines. 
टाइम for the booster but the thing is that our in india our vaccine is controlled by the government and uh, they will if you know that your covin app is so has captured your data from aadhar so you you will be given the vaccine what the government desires for you and right. me we will not be able to choose again mm. so, so if said, if we have a choice so booster if we, also we yeah. will be the guinea pigs as no, somebody if, said if if any but choice if we have a choice then then it would it be recommended if you have a choice okay okay you can go for pfizer or whatever sir pata nahi the grass is always greener on the right. other side or american grass to hame hamesha se bahut achhi lagti hai there was pankaj i would like to answer this question there was a very recent study which has been published about few days back only where the vaccine the first dose vaccine with the johnson and johnson or the pfizer or the moderna and the uh, these patients who the renally uh, renally compromised patients who are having uh, immunocompromised and they were all sorts of uh, um, immunosuppressive therapy because they were renal transplant patients and then the third dose of the booster was given to these patients those patients who had very low titers of antibodies third dose of booster with the heterologous uh, boost vaccine or by the same vaccine were able to augment the antibody titers uh, irrespective of the fact what sort of vaccine was the first vaccine but those patients who, who were uh, on uh, immunosuppressive therapy and did not have any antibody titers these vaccines the third dose even was not able to produce any antibody titer they can only boost they cannot uh, like they cannot uh, generate the antibodies uh, fresh right so i think yeah, I, have uh, one, i have one only comment please and after that i will keep the gulf countries have already started promoting booster vaccination after 6 months of the second dose irrespective of the antibody titers we are unnecessary harping on antibody titers that mean nothing but booster vaccine that means the third dose of the same or different vaccine the choice is left to the population and they have already started it. and in fact they don't allow people to enter their malls and if they are not at the third dose that is the booster dose right so i think that is question has been answered well oh, the other question the last question uh, dr upta sir uh, regarding the vaccination after natural infections who are having very high titers of antibodies do they need vaccination vaccine we go on can't go on measure it's a logistic issue you can't go on measuring the antibodies and then but generally if you ask me the microbiology perspective is that you allow the natural antibodies at least to go down below their threshold level otherwise you are wasting the vaccine why does the government say that if a patient who has received convalescent plasma should wait for 3 months before he becomes uh, after becoming rt pcr negative and a person who's not received plasma the uh, goi guideline say 6 to 8 weeks after they become negative so that is for the natural course of antibodies to go down so that you get the best benefit out of the vaccine and you get the best benefit out of your natural infection also and they don't interfere and you know cause a kind of a, you you will only be increasing the side effect i had a slide uh, which said that there was a study which said that if you keep on giving the vaccine doses in infected individuals only the side effects multiply the effects will remain the same but the side effects like fever and sight pain at the injection site they are much more higher reported in such individuals i removed it because i thought that we are not going to talk about vaccination so i kind of intentionally removed it i think right. that, uh, dr pankaj it is the time to thank you madam yeah. and thank uh, Thank you. So, uh, Roda Shok, you can uh, take over now. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Sonal uh, Saxena, madam. Uh, madam has presented very well regarding COVID-19 antibody and its response. And I think uh, she, madam, has uh, cleared uh, various doubts regarding the vaccine and uh, their uh, efficacy also. I thank uh, Dr. Rahul Nathani, sir, uh, for being here to chair the session and giving his, his wonderful. Uh, 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 discussion and also thank i thank dr vijay arora sir uh, to uh, uh, for uh, 
<laughs> being here before me and he started session thank you sir for being here and i, I also thank dr s gupta sir sir has moderated the session very well and uh, make this uh, make the topic very interactive i thanks all of all of you uh, very much sir